Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to introduce norms, which are ways that we can measure the sizes of objects such as vectors, matrices, and functions. We'll introduce the mathematical definition of a norm, we'll look at several different examples of norms, and we'll also derive several useful mathematical results about norms that we'll make use of in later parts of this course. In this course, we've already seen several examples of the use of norms. We made use of the Euclidean norm to look at the sizes of vectors, and when we were looking at functions, we made use of the infinity norm to look at the accuracy of polynomial interpolation. And more generally, we can think of a norm as a way to measure the sizes of elements in a vector space. And mathematically, we can think of a norm as a function from a vector space to the real numbers and it must satisfy the following three conditions. Firstly, for any element x in our vector space, the norm of x has to be greater than or equal to zero, and equality is achieved if and only if x is the zero element of our vector space. In addition, if we look at any real number gamma, then the norm of gamma times x is equal to the magnitude of gamma times the norm of x, and if we look at any two elements, x and y, in our vector space, then the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. And we refer to this as the triangle inequality because it follows by thinking of x, y, and x plus y as vectors along the edges of a triangle. From the triangle inequality, we can derive a useful alternative inequality, often referred to as the reverse triangle inequality, that tells us that the magnitude of the norm of x minus the norm of y is less than or equal to the norm of x minus y. And to prove this, let's write that a is equal to y, and b is equal to x minus y, and then apply the triangle inequality to a and b. So we'll get then that the norm of x is equal to the norm of a plus b, and that's less than or equal to the norm of a plus the norm of b, and that's equal to the norm of y plus the norm of x minus y. And if we rewrite that, it tells us then that the norm of x minus the norm of y is less than or equal to the norm of x minus y. And if we now flip x and y in our definitions of a and b, that allows us to derive the slightly stronger statement that the magnitude of the norm of x minus the norm of y is less than or equal to the norm of x minus y. Let's now look at some typical norms that we'll use on the n-dimensional space r to the n. And the most common norm that we'll see is the Euclidean norm, that we also refer to as the 2 norm. And this is defined for a vector x in terms of the sum from j hook 1 to n of the components x, j squared, all taken to a square root. And if we look at this expression, then we see that we're taking this second power of all of these components, taking the sum, and then taking the half power. And this motivates a more general expression of the p-norm that we define by saying that we take the sum from j1 to n of the magnitudes of the xj to the pth power, and then we take the resulting expression to a power of 1 over p. And this will be a valid norm for any p greater than or equal to 1. If p is less than 1, then we can verify that the triangle inequality will be violated. So suppose we now look at this p-norm expression as p tends to infinity. So there'll be one component of the vector of largest magnitude, and let's call that xi. So as p tends to infinity, the term in this sum corresponding to xi will start to dominate all of the rest as we take higher and higher powers. And so the sum will start to evaluate to roughly equal to the magnitude of xi to the p. And when we take the pth root, then we'll just be left with the magnitude of xi. So that motivates this definition of the infinity norm of a vector to just be the maximum over all of the different components, i equal 1 to n, of the magnitudes of xi. And it's worth comparing this expression to the infinity norm that we defined for functions. There, for a function defined on a continuous interval, 
we define the infinity norm in terms of the maximum magnitude of that function evaluated over any point in that interval. And we see that these two definitions are in close agreement with each other. Just that here we're talking about the finite dimensional case, and for a function we're talking about the infinite dimensional case. Let's now look at a small Python example, norm.py, that can evaluate some different norms in Python. And in particular, we'll look at the p-norm as p gets large, and we'll see that this approaches the infinity norm value. Let's now take a look at the norm.py example that tests Python's functions for calculating different types of norms. And in this program, we'll first create an arbitrary vector x, and we'll give it a number of different components, and the one with largest magnitude is this minus 2.35 term here. And we'll then create a list of p norms that we want to calculate from 1 to 100, and we'll calculate the corresponding p norms using the numpy.linalge.norm command with the optional argument of p to calculate the p norm. We'll separately calculate the infinity norm by passing in the value of infinity into that extra argument. And we'll then plot the norms. So we'll plot the p norm as a function of p. And then we'll also plot a horizontal line that indicates the infinity norm value. So if I run this program, then we'll get the following plot. So we'll see, therefore, that as p increases, the p norm does indeed approach that infinity norm value of 2.35 that's being set by the magnitude of this term right here. We'll generally make use of whichever norm is most appropriate or convenient for a particular task. For example, when we looked at linear least squares problems, we made use of the Euclidean norm because it has nice differentiability properties that we made use of. So different norms give us different but related measures of size. And a useful fact is that if we're looking on a finite dimensional vector space, such as r to the n, then all norms are equivalent. And here, when we talk about equivalence, we mean the following property. So suppose we look at two norms, a and b, on a finite dimensional vector space v then we can find constants c1 and c2 greater than zero in the real numbers, such that for any element x in v, we have that c1 times the norm of a is less than or equal to the norm of b, which is less than or equal to c2 times the norm of a. And equivalently, we have that 1 over c2 times the norm of b is less than or equal to the norm of a, which is less than or equal to 1 over c1 times the norm of b. And hence, we know that all of these norms differ from each other by a most a constant factor. And that tells us that if we can derive an inequality for some calculation with respect to a certain norm, then it will also be true for a different norm up to an appropriate scaling introduced by these c1 and c2 factors. In some cases, we can explicitly calculate their c1 and c2. For example, Let's look in the vector space r to the n, and we can show that for an element x in r to the n, we have that the 2 norm of x is less than or equal to the 1 norm of x, which is less than or equal to root n times the 2 norm of x. And let's now look at the two inequalities in this expression. So first, let's look at the 2 norm of x squared, and we can write that out then as the sum from j equal 1 to n of xj squared, and that will be less than or equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n of the magnitude of xj, all squared. And the reason that we can use this inequality here is because we, if we multiply out this expression, then we'll get all of the terms on the previous expression plus a number of cross terms as well. So therefore we can establish that we have this inequality. And this expression is then just equal to the 1 norm of x squared. So therefore we can conclude that the 2 norm of x is less than or equal to the 1 norm of x. So now let's look at the other inequality. So if we look at the 1 norm of x, we can write that out as the sum from j equal 1 to n of 1 times the magnitude of xj. And that can be less than or equal to the sum from j equal 1 to n of 1 squared, all to the half power, times the sum from j equal 1 to n of 
xj squared to the half power. And this expression follows from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And if we now rewrite this expression, we can get that that's equal to the square root of n times the 2 norm of x, which establishes the second inequality in our expression. So different norms give us different measures of size. And we'll now take a look at a few examples. As mentioned, different norms give different measures of size. And one nice way to visualize this in two dimensions is to look at a unit circle, which is all of the points x that satisfy that the norm of x is equal to 1. And if we look at different norms, then we'll get different shapes. So let's first take a look at the 1 norm. And here, the unit circle for the 1 norm is a diamond that has vertices at plus or minus 1 comma 0 and 0 comma plus or minus 1. And if we think about how distances are defined for the one norm, and we look at a point on the diamond, then the distance to that point will be just the sum of the horizontal and vertical contributions to get there. And if we increase the horizontal contribution, then we'll have to correspondingly decrease the vertical contribution, and that will sweep out one side of the diamond. The one norm is often referred to as the taxicab norm or the Manhattan norm since it measures distances in terms of summing their vertical and horizontal contributions separately. So it's similar to if you were traveling on a grid, such as if you were a taxicab moving around in Manhattan. If we look at the two norm, then the unit circle in this case is indeed just a circle of radius one. And if we look at a vector, on the surface of the circle, then we'll just measure that distance in terms of the typical Euclidean distance. If we look at the infinity norm, then the unit circle works out to be a square of side length 2. And my personal favorite norm is the 4 norm. And here we find that the unit circle actually works out to be a shape that's referred to as the super ellipse and it has this very aesthetically pleasing curvy shape. When we look at all four norms together then we see that there's a nice transition in their shape. As we increase the value of p in the p norm then our shape progressively approaches the square shape. So I actually really like the four norm. And I like it so much that I made this small celebratory movie to appreciate its aesthetic beauty. And this movie was made using Povray, a free ray tracing software package that's great for doing scientific visualization. You can initialize different shapes and lights and give them texture, and it makes these really great photorealistic graphics. So here I created this four norm and I started to rotate it, and we can see all of the reflections off this surface. And not content with one four norm, I extended this out so that it would actually expand into seven four norms that will all rotate around one another. And as you can see here, the surfaces of all these four norms are slightly reflective and leads to these really beautiful reflection patterns in all of their surfaces. So I hope you appreciate the forenorm as much as I do, and you should definitely check out Povray because it's got some really interesting features for scientific visualization. Let's now consider an application of norms called the Voronoi tessellation. And this is personally something that I'm really interested in. Suppose that we've got a number of points xj in a domain. And for example, we could look at 10 randomly distributed points in a square as shown on the left here. Now for each one of those points xj, we could define a corresponding Voronoi cell, which would be the space in the domain x that satisfies that the norm from x to xj is less than the norm from x to xi for all i not equal to j. So essentially, for each one of these points, we're going to surround it by the cell of space that's closer to it than any other with respect to this norm. And if we do that, 
then we'll have boundaries between the different Voronoi cells. And that gives us what we refer to as the Voronoi tessellation. And for these 10 points here, the Voronoi tessellation will look like this. So each one of these points will be surrounded by this polygonal Voronoi cell. And here we're making use of the Euclidean norm, which is a typical way that Voronoi cells are defined. And if we look at any edge in our Voronoi tessellation, then it will be the perpendicular bisector between two neighboring points. The Voronoi tessellation has many different applications. It's used a lot in materials modeling. It can be used for analyzing particle systems. It can be used for creating computational meshes. It's also used in biological modeling as kind of a simple model for cell matrices. And it's also used in geography. And for example, suppose that you imagine that these 10 points here represented hospitals in a city. Then the Voronoi cells could represent the areas that each hospital serves, because if a patient was located in one of those Voronoi cells, then the corresponding hospital would be the closest one to their location. There's a number of software packages that you can use for computing the Voronoi tessellation. I've actually written one that's called Voro++ that's available from math.lbl.gov slash Voro++. And there's two others called QHOL and CGAL that stands for Computational Geometry Algorithms Library. So there's an interesting little exercise that you can do when you think about Voronoi boundaries between two points. And as mentioned, if you look in the Euclidean norm, then the Voronoi boundary between two points will just be the perpendicular bisector. And you could draw this dashed line between the two points, draw a right angle halfway along, and that will then give you your perpendicular bisector. So suppose now that we look at the Voronoi line between two points under different norms. So we could look at this for the one norm on the left here, and we could look at this for the infinity norm on the right here. And we could ask ourselves, what line will actually divide the Voronoi cells between these two points under these different norms? And I'll pause for a second here to allow you to think about this, and you can perhaps go away and try and come up with the answer. So let's now look at the answer to this problem. So we'll first look at the one norm case. And one thing that we can actually deduce is that the Voronoi line between these two points must pass through the midpoint between A and B. This follows just by, by symmetry. We know that our norms are not sensitive to rotations by 90 degrees or reflections and Therefore, just by symmetry, it has to pass through this midpoint. And if we do some analysis, then we can actually find that if we draw some horizontal lines from A to B, then we can actually find that the Voronoi line will be at 45 degrees through this middle section. And then when it hits those horizontal lines, it will actually transition to be vertical. If we look at the infinity norm case now, then we have a similar picture emerge. If you draw lines at 45 degrees, then you find that there's a central vertical section in this Voronoi line that then switches into a diagonal line at 45 degrees on either side. Let's now take a look at calculating the Voronoi tessellation with respect to several different types of norm. And to do this, we're going to make use of the VizPy library for interactive scientific visualization. And one of the nice features of the VizPy library is it has some GPU acceleration that we're going to make use of here. So if you go to the VizPy website and you click on the gallery link, then you can actually find that one of their standard examples is to compute Voronoi diagrams. Although by default, this example only computes Voronoi diagrams with respect to the Euclidean norm. And if you click on this program, then you can go to the source code. 
that I've downloaded a copy that we're going to take a look at. So if you want to make an image of the Voronoi tessellation, then it's actually rather straightforward. You can consider each pixel in the image. And I've shown a little diagram down here where I'm considering a pixel shown by this black pentagon. And at that black pentagon, you can compute the distance to each of the points that are in your Voronoi tessellation. And the point that is closest will tell you that you belong to that Voronoi cell. And so to create an image, you would just consider all of the pixels and every one of them, you can compute all of these distances. And this type of calculation is very well suited to being done on a GPU since every pixel can be computed independently. So if we take a look at this Voronoi example for VizPy, then one of the key routines here is this main function that's written so that the GPU can process it. And what it does is that there are 32 different seed points in the Voronoi tessellation. And this main function will calculate for a given pixel the closest seed point. And to do this calculation of nearest point, it makes use of a function that I wrote called my distance that will take in two, two component vectors and calculate a distance with respect to a particular norm. And so by default here, I'm making use of the two norm. And for computational efficiency, this function is just returning the two norm squared so that I don't have to bother with doing a square root. So let me now run this program. and we get the following result. And you can see here how I can actually move the mouse around and this will move one of the generating points around and we can see how the Voronoi tessellation is affected when that one point is moving around. And as expected, we see that in this case, all the Voronoi cells are polygons. So now let's modify the program so that rather than using the two norm, it makes use of the one norm. And we'll run the program again. And so here then, we see those telltale signatures of boundaries that are at 45 degrees and are horizontal and vertical. And we can also see there's this interesting feature where as we move points around, sometimes lines can flip from being horizontal to vertical. Now let's take a look at the infinity norm. And this has some similarities to the one norm, although here we see that typically there is a horizontal or vertical line between two points that then transitions into this 45 degree line further away. And again, sometimes we see these discrete switches where that 45 degree line can flip from pointing to the top left to the top right. And finally, let's take a look at my favorite four norm. And again, for computational efficiency, we won't take the root of power four. Instead, we'll just return the fourth power of the four norm. And so here we end up with these nice kind of curvy Voronoi cell shapes. There are many ways to find norms on matrices, 
For example, we can make use of the Frobenius norm that's written with a subscript capital F, where we take the sum of squares of components of our matrix all to a square root. And we can think of the Frobenius norm as rewriting our matrix into a long vector and then taking the Euclidean norm of that vector. We also saw previously in this course how if we are given a vector norm, then we can derive an induced matrix norm from it. So let's look at an arbitrary vector norm that we write with a subscript P. Then we can define the corresponding matrix norm on a matrix A here as the norm of A is equal to the maximum over all non-zero vectors x of the norm of Ax divided by the norm of x. And equivalently, we can think of this as the maximum over all vectors x with norm 1 of the norm of Ax. And this definition implies this useful property that the norm of Ax is less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of x. And to derive this, we can write down that the norm of Ax is equal to the norm of Ax divided by the norm of x multiplied by the norm of x. And we can combine those first two terms and use an inequality here. So we can say that that will be less than or equal to the maximum over all non-zero vectors v of the norm of Av divided by the norm of v multiplied by the norm of x. And that bracketed term is our definition of our matrix norm. So we can rewrite that then in terms of the norm of A times the norm of X. So if we look at these induced norms, then it turns out that the induced norms corresponding to the vector 1 norm and vector infinity norm actually work out to have some simple expressions. And the induced matrix 1 norm works out to be the maximum column sum over all of the magnitudes of the components in our matrix. Similarly, the induced infinity norm of a matrix works out to be the maximum row sum of the magnitudes of terms in our matrix. So we'll see how to actually compute the matrix 2 norm in a later chapter in this unit. Previously, when we introduced the condition number of a matrix A, we defined it in terms of the norm of a matrix A multiplied by the norm of A inverse. And when we did this derivation, we made use of the induced matrix norm from the Euclidean vector norm. But this definition will actually work for any other norm that we define on matrices. And both Python and MATLAB have functions that can calculate the condition number. And while they compute the condition number by default with respect to this induced Euclidean norm, they will actually return the condition number with respect to different norms as well. And if a matrix A is square and it is singular, then by definition we say that the condition number of that matrix is equal to infinity.